So just as a reminder, uh, asymptotically flat and in last 20 years in particular, anti deceiver space times have been studied extensively, both from the uh, point of view of uh, their thermodynamics, but also from the point of view of uh, uh, holography. And um, it's really those types that by now we understand very well. On the other hand, it's somewhat surprising that uh, more general exotic backgrounds uh, that are not asymptotically flat or anti deceiver namely those that are supported by additional matter fields running in the asymptotics, have attracted attention uh, only in relative recent history. Uh, typical examples that we have encountered in, uh, say, uh, uh, studies uh, within string theory or holography approach uh, are, for example, uh, examples of solutions uh, associated with flux vacua of certain string compactification that happen to be dual within holography to certain supersymmetric four-dimensional quantum field theory like klebanov strassler solution. Even more recently, the study of Lifshitz black holes uh, has been also uh, uh, studied extensively. Uh, uh, in particular because they could have dual description uh, in terms of non-relativistic quantum mechanical systems of interest to uh, uh, condensed matter. Uh, in, in my personal uh, efforts, uh, it is actually the, that type of geometries that we dub subtracted geometries and were proposed uh, to address a microscopic study of certain non-extremal black holes that motivated us for uh, addressing uh, more exotic asymptotics. Okay. So as a first step in such studies, uh, one would like to uh, first address its geometric mesoscopic properties. And if we can extract new features out of them, and so the first things to really address properly is, uh, uh, as I'm saying, geometric properties uh, uh, for uh, such exotic asymptotics before we start addressing any kind of other dynamic holographic features. Now, certain properties of black hole background, for example, like black hole entropy or temperature are typically not expected to be sensitive to the asymptotic behavior of uh, black holes because they are expected to be intrinsically connected to the properties of the horizon of the black hole. However, there are other conserved charges, for example, electric conserved charge, but also, in particular, the mass of the black hole or uh, even angular momentum, as well as, say, free energy, Euclidean action of such backgrounds, are expected to depend on space-time asymptotics. And so uh, uh, it's in this regime where they would start receiving contribution from running matter fields. Now, what typically happens in such backgrounds is that one encounters large distance divergences, okay. which then typically play the determination of conserved charges. And it's not always clear that one can remedy them uh, with uh, standard techniques, say, via introducing regulated Kumar integral or some specific background subtractions. So the, the main motivation of this part of the work was to formulate a well-posed variational pros, uh, problem to study this new asymptotic geometries the way we have learned from lessons by studying ADS geometry. And it's via this well-posed variational problem 
uh, that uh, would allow us to determine corresponding conserved charges and then derive also all the consequences of black hole thermodynamics for such exotic geometries. Now this approach is in principle general, namely it does not necessarily rely on specific theory or on specific asymptotic solution. But I have to say a large part of this talk will be devoted to apply it to the example of a previously mentioned subtractive geometry. Now, it depends how much time I will have. I thought I would mention the summary of this outcome because it's really the, uh, uh, the addressing variational problem for this new asymptotic geometries can be in principle formulated in really rather algorithmic way. And so this is just a summary and then I don't have to repeat it at the end of the lecture while you still have a little bit of attention. Uh, so, uh, the, the idea is, is to identify the parameters of a specific solution that, whose thermodynamics or conserved charges we want to determine. Namely, in, in other ways, we would call those parameters integration constants, and they would be split in two types. Namely, in the ones that we are free to turn on and off and they are associated with the internal small radius properties of the theory and uh, uh, referred to for uh, in connection with holography as normalizable parameters. And then there are other type of parameters that I'm going to refer to as non-renormalizable ones. And those are the ones that we cannot simply turn off because they are the ones that satisfy the new exotic asymptotics. Okay. Now, it turns out that this non-denormalizable mode can be fixed only up to classes of transformations associated with the local symmetry uh, of this bulk theory. Okay. So they are fixed only up to transformation induced by local symmetry of the bulk theory. In particular, in our case, we are uh, interested in large radius behavior of the theory. So those would be radial diffeomorphisms, as well as some additional global symmetries that this theory may have. Now, uh, the key point in uh, determining then the full-fledged, what one would refer to a renormalized finite action of the theories is to determine the boundary bulk action which turns out uh, uh, to be fixed completely in terms of solving asymptotic behavior of the solutions. Of course, supported by this non-normalizable mode. So determination of the covariant boundary action of that type by really uh, solving equations of motion of the original action for the asymptotic solution would allow us then to uh, uh, identify the full-fledged uh, uh, radial coordinate independent action. Okay. And it's within this action that, uh, uh, that now defines also uh, for us, the renormalized canonical momenta, which are basically conserved charges associated with different asymptotic killing symmetries of the theory uh, that uh, are now determined completely by this renormalized action. So it's from this renormalized actions that we uniquely can determine conserved charges. Now, corresponding conserved charges then would at the end automatically satisfy for example, the first law of thermodynamics for such configurations. Okay. So the key point in this is really identifying what does non-renormalizable modes really determine the covariant uh, boundary term from s solving uh, 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 actually Ham uh, hamilton jacobi equations for the asymptotic solutions, and then the rest should fall out, uh, shall come out automatically. This is now uh, uh, in principle algorithmic thing, but it's 
subtleties that we encounter in this context uh, uh, that at the end, you know, were polished and allowed us to properly uh, determine all the conserved charges uh, and corresponding thermodynamics. Now, uh, this basically would be, in a nutshell, the key questions and the outcome of the analysis. But now for the rest of my talk, I'm going to put things in a bit bigger perspective because I want to motivate for you why we actually ended up with this exotic asymptotics and what motivated us to study this exotic uh, asymptotics. So uh, really more for some of the people with less background in the field, I would like to motivate a bit um, the progress that one has made in string theory in terms of trying to identify microscopic properties of black holes and uh, really highlight what we do seem to understand well at the microscopic levels and then turn to studying uh, and motivating the subtracted geometry, which, was, which is basically motivating to advance some, our, uh, some of our further understanding of internal structure of black holes in string theory. Okay. Uh, so I will probably spend most of the time just on classical properties of the subtracted geometry after justifying its motivation. And really very briefly, because it's somewhat tangential uh, to the topic uh, of uh, conserved charges for subtracted geometry. I'll mention very briefly some of the initial studies of its quantum properties. And then in the last part, I will really uh, uh, try to expand uh, in, in a bit more de details about uh, conserved charges and deriving thermodynamics via the uh, previously summarized variational principle. Okay. So, uh, you know, one of the key issues that motivates us in study black hole physics is uh, uh, an effort to trying to relate the thermodynamic, say, entropy of black holes, which is related to one quarter of the area of the horizon, to its statistical interpretation, and in particular to understand the microscopic degrees of freedom that form statistical entropy of the black holes. Now, string theory put few cents into this question. In particular, uh, the, the main uh, progress in understanding microscopic origin of black hole entropy was in studying the so-called extremal black holes in string theory. Okay. So those are black holes that have mass related in some schematic way to the corresponding charges of the black hole. So the, such extremal black hole turn out to be typically supersymmetric backgrounds or also referred to as BPS black hole. And in string theory, they are typically parameterized by more than one electric or magnetic charge because we, we have more sources of abelian, say, gate symmetry. So they are typically multi-charge black holes. Being actually supersymmetric black hole or a BPS black hole or extremal black hole naturally forces the angular momentum in four dimensions for these black holes to be zero. Now, when I'm talking about these extremal black holes, I'm specifically talking about black holes that are asymptotically flat. Okay. So in, in string theory, uh, the progress that we have made in understanding microscopic properties of this specific type of black holes is related to the insights we have gained about gravity field theory correspondence, uh, or ADS CFT correspondence, or holography that I already alluded to earlier, where actually the description in general of string theory and particular geometry, and in these extremal cases, the near horizon geometry is typically that of uh, uh, anti deceiver space-time. Okay. So describing a string theory on, on specific 
curve space in D dimensions is related to specific field theory on the boundary in one dimension less. And for the case of space-time being ADS, one expects the boundary field theory to have behavior of conformal field theory. Now for that type of extremal black holes I'm referring to, it was actually very specific ADS-CFT correspondence that seems to work well. Namely, it's anti deceter space-time in three dimensions. It's geometry of that type that one uh, typically deduces from the behavior of uh, extremal black hole near horizon features is related to two-dimensional dual conformal field theory, for which we also have a lot of uh, uh, rather uh, uh, developed techniques that come basically from quantization of quantum field the uh, of, of string theory. So, uh, so th these prototypes that were uh, really uh, uh, understood uh, well uh, were initiated in the work of Strominger and Waffa more than how many years? 20 years ago, and are related to supersymmetric multi charge black holes with zero cosmological constant, as I say, and have description in terms of dual CFT in two dimensions. Uh, but one was able to generalize. Uh, uh, this understanding uh, also to the cases of BPS black holes that, uh, that are close to extreme, uh, sorry, near BPS black holes, namely those that have a mass slightly above the extremal black holes. And uh, one, at least in, in the context of relationship to ADS3 uh, slash CF2 correspondence, uh, all these typical black holes, multi charge, rotating, uh, and with zero cosmological constant in near extremal case uh, fit uh, the description in terms of this correspondence. Uh, there was some further progress, but not so uh, uh, relevant specifically um, uh, for the BPS study. Nevertheless, there, there is progress uh, on trying to understand microscopically also this, another type of extremal black holes but in this case, they are strictly rotating black holes. Those are, in terms of BPS features, they have mass above the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sum uh, of charges, but uh, the mass is closely tied to the angular momentum of black holes. So this is the like extremal curve black hole has, for example, no charge and definitely a mass bigger than zero, but the angular momentum is related to its mass. And, and they were, uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there were certain attempts trying to understand uh, microscopic features in terms of what one refers to as curve CFT correspondence. Uh, however, the CFT is of much uh, more involved structure than the simple dual CFTs. Okay, so I, I don't think I have to, uh, either time uh, um, or uh, yeah, a real interest to go more into that because this is rather old story, okay? And uh, try to turn uh, and ask question, can we do more about microscopics of black holes when they are not extremal, okay? Namely, the generic multi-charge rotating black holes that really have mass completely unconstrained. And this is basically the main motivation to study subtractive geometry. Okay. So now I will turn to explain how we arrived at this type of geometry okay, uh, with the motivation to start addressing internal structure of non-extremal black holes. Okay. So uh, we... Uh, with Finn Larson, we asked ourselves about five years ago if we could somehow quantify some past observations from almost 20 years ago that actually not only extremal but also non-extreme black holes might have explanation or might have some ties to 
microscopic explanation in terms of dual two-dimensional quantum field theory, just like this near-extremal or extremal black holes. And within this approach, again, we focus on non-extreme asymptotically flat black holes that have charge, they are rotating, and they could either be in four or five dimensions. So this is the specific question we wanted to ask ourselves for four or five dimensional black holes uh, that are generally non-extremer and can we extract some of the hints of uh, dual uh, two-dimensional field theory behavior. Okay. So I'll quantify shortly what I mean by past observations, okay? But let me point out that the upshot in this uh, uh, attempt was uh, to focus on a black hole that being closed in a specific box. Okay? So we start with general non-extremal black hole with zero cosmological constant, okay? and enclose this uh, black hole in a box in very specific way to create a system that would now have manifest conformal symmetry. Again, I'll come to that and quantify that shortly. And I, uh, so, so with, within this attempt, we arrived at formulating the box in a way that only mildly modifies the original geometry of those asymptotically flat black holes by changing only in the black holes a specific war factor. And it's the change of the specific war factor that we refer to as subtracted geometry. Okay? So those are just now words. I have to turn first to this motivation. Okay? What do I mean by past observations? Okay? And then I'll quantify specifically how we determine the new war factor for which we claim that the conformal symmetry is manifest. Okay. So I have to choose the type of black holes I'm going to study. So this will be non-extreme black holes from string theory. And again, they will be asymptotically flat. And in this talk, it's going to be only four dimensions. Okay. Again, those, were, those would be black hole with mass unconstrained. In general, they are specified by multiple charges as well as angular momentum. Okay. So the prototype will be solutions that arise in so-called maximally supersymmetric supergravities in four dimensions. Those are basically effective uh, this is an effective action of toroidally compactified effective string theory. Okay, so we start with 10 dimensional supergravity theory, an effective theory of particular string theory like type 2 or heterotic. We compactify it on torus and obtain four dimensions maximal supersymmetric supergravity theory. Now, consistent truncation of such maximally supersymmetric supergravity theories is the so-called SDU model. Okay. I, I have to stay within the effective action that comes from string theory if I want to motivate the microscopic or internal structure of non-extremal black holes. So for the moment, no, it's no, 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 no. It's it's not in this context. It's really trying to uncover ADS three somewhere. Okay, and this, is, as I wasn't specific in my explanations earlier, but it's somehow uncovering ADS3 somewhere, okay? So let's go on, and maybe I can convince you, okay? So, uh, so, so I'm going to, to, to go to, to consistently truncated effective action of toroidally compactified string theory, okay? Uh, it's a useful prototype because I can generate out of this black holes the black holes of the full-fledged n equal 4 or n equal 8 uh, uh, four-dimensional supergravity theory. Okay? So this is a Lagrangian specified by the metric. 
by three gauge fields with index A and the fourth one with index zero, and also by three dilatons, scalar field, and three axion fields. So the black holes that uh, arise in this theory will be explicit solutions of these equations of motion and will be specified by metric for U1 gauge fields. That's what I mean multi-charge because they are, there, there are four uh, 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 gauge potentials and three axiodilaton fields. Okay. So in principle, those are complicated solutions, but they arise as solutions of this Lagrangian now, the way one actually obtains these solutions uh, is via what we call generating technique. So the prototype obtained a long time ago is specified by four charges associated with these four gauge potentials. Okay? And it has uh, also angular momentum and general mass. So the way this solution was obtained from such complicated Lagrangian is really, as I say, by solution generating techniques. One starts with just curl black hole, rotating black hole, which is also a solution of this Lagrangian, reduces the solution on time-like vector down to three dimensions and uses this enlarged symmetry in lower dimension to generate new type of solutions. So in particular, there are four specific boosts of, of a big symmetry in one dimension lower. So those are the transformation unimposed on time-reduced curved black hole. Okay. Four of them obtain now new solution in four dimensions, which now looks in four dimensions as a solution of four with four charges specified by each of these SO1,1 boosts. It turns out that this solution was not the most general solution because it's specified only by four charges, okay? Uh, there was effectively only one parameter missing and was, uh, in, it took really almost 20 years to properly identify this missing parameter and obtain actually the general solution with four electric and four magnetic charges. But that's just technicality and a side point, okay? So let me stay with this four charge black hole solution, okay? And write, uh, stare at the metric of the solution, okay? So uh, this solution is described as U1 time vibration over three dimensional spatial base, okay? And except for these war factors, the rest of it is described in rather simple form, okay? So as a general solution, it has a mass, charge, four charges, and angular momentum. I can trade the six parameters of this solution equivalently for the mass of original curl, angular momentum of original curl, and for boost. So that's equivalent description of this four charge black hole solution. Okay. So uh, 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 this particular vibration over the base, so this one forum is not that complicated. It's specified by bare mass, by curve angular momentum, and just products, one product of Cauchy's four boosts and another product of cinches, so it's very compact, okay? So those are the simple parts, okay? But you can see that actual uh, war factor is horrendous. By the way, originally, in original paper, the solution was written over two pages, so oh, that's it's okay to years to write it like this, okay? Anyway, let me highlight some of the properties. The solutions all have two horizons, inner and outer horizons. So this is a generic property of asymptotically flat black holes, rotating or not and charged or not. Okay. It also reduces to well-known special cases in general relativity. Okay. If all those boosts are equal, 
we then get a solution specified by mass, one charge and angular momentum. So this is a standard Kerr-Newman solution. Scalars freeze, they, can, they, they don't run in this case. Okay. Of course, we turn on their angular momentum, then it's a static solution and with equal charges, uh, equal boost, this is Reisner Nordstrom black hole. So uh, the well-known general relativity examples are also encoded in the solution. There are, of course, also extreme black holes, the so-called BPS black holes that here are obtained by setting the bare mass to zero and boost to infinity while keeping this combination of bare mass and boost finite. This is finite fixed charge. And then uh, in this case, you can see that mass is indeed related to the sum of four charges. So it includes all the well-known things. It's a good pro prototype to study this black hole solution. Okay. So what's crucial is, is here that we have also, all of them have inner and outer horizon. And then except for this messy warp factor, the rest is rather simple. The rest is only specified by bare mass, bare uh, angular momentum, and two parameters, product of Cauchy's and product of Sintry's. Anyway, so a long time ago, there was a, a general observation that the thermodynamics of these black holes is very suggestive of describing it in terms of weakly coupled two-dimensional field theory, namely, in terms of left moving and right moving type excitations. Okay. So what do I mean specifically by that? One studies thermodynamics of black holes associated with the horizon feature. So the area of the outer horizon can be written in terms of two building blocks, SL and SR. Okay. And the area of inner horizon because the only two horizons is written as a difference of the same building blocks. Okay. So that actually the, this uh, was early observed right away, but actually associated now these degrees of freedom with the properties of outer and inner horizon was really advanced together with, uh, with Finn Larsen. Similarly, studying the surface gravity in this particular case is actually the inverse temperature on the outer horizon is also made out of two building blocks and on the inner horizon with the difference of the building blocks. So there, is, there, there are some building blocks very reminiscent of left and right moving degrees of excitations of dual field theory, okay? And both inner and outer horizon thermodynamic quantities seem to reflect that. Okay. Okay. And similarly, you can do that for angular velocities as well. Okay. Now, as you can see, these properties of inner and outer horizon build out of this left and right moving building blocks turn out to depend on fewer parameters than original black hole solution namely only on the bare mass, bare, bare angular momentum, and the products of these Cauchy's and Sinchis. We have four independent boosts, but the answer depends only on products of Cauchy's and Sinchis. Okay. Anyway, it took you know, uh, quite a while <laughs> to realize that these thermodynamic properties of the outer and inner horizon are completely independent of this warp factor. One can cut, you put arbitrary warp factor there, it's horrendous for the real black hole. Right? It's messy. But thermodynamics on inner and outer horizon it does not depend on that. Okay? So that was a very surprising fact that actually led us to justify that we can now modify this geometry by just changing this war factor while keeping all the thermal properties of inner and outer horizon completely intact. Okay? And that's what we would dub, you know, the, the, uh, uh, this modification, we will dub that as a black hole box. Okay? And for a particular choice of this black hole box, particular choice of a new war factor, which still keeps all this thermo intact. We expect the conformal symmetry. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. 
So uh, it was uh, only um, uh, for specific value of this war factor, we hope to get this conformal symmetry that is somewhere related to this to DCFT really manifest. Okay? So let me go on and justify how we arrive now with this new modified Bohr factor, namely the new box, for which we believe that the manifest conformal symmetry starts emerging. Okay? All right. So, uh, so we are after now describing a geometry of black holes where I'm changing only the Bohr factor. And the way we approach this problem originally is by studying a wave equation for a massless scalar in this black hole background, but writing now this um, wave equation with implicit value of the warp factor. Okay. So specifically, what we are after is looking at this Laplacian that uh, 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 the, the massless, uh, that acts on a massless scalar field, okay, we wanted to solve this Laplacian for massless scalar field in terms of hypergeometric functions, a radial part, okay. Why? Because from examples of extremal and near extremal black holes, that turns out to be the outcome, that all those black hole solutions, they have special parameters for extreme and near extreme. They manifestly were solved by hypergeometric functions in the near horizon regime, okay? Now, these hypergeometric functions have manifest SL2R square symmetry that we then, in principle, want to promote to full-fledged two-dimensional field theory, okay? So our goal was now, let's take this non-extremal black hole and fiddle with this war factor. This war factor doesn't change thermodynamics. This is still the same thermodynamics of the black hole. This will just be the box in which I'm putting the original black hole, okay? And I'm gonna adjust this war factor in such a way that I'm gonna solve the Laplacian for massless scalar field with hypergeometric functions, okay? And this has to be done, can be done completely uniquely with this condition. Namely, it's, it's in specifically, it's this reduced uh, form, you see, uh, that depends only on pi c's and pi r's, okay? And then we have uh, this uh, now abstract war factor. And g, if you recall, this is this, um, um, ergosphere condition depends on theta, okay? So you see this combination miraculously for all those black holes is such that it separates into just um, polar angle function and radial angle function, okay? Which makes this solution separable, okay? So also for new war factor, we wanted to make this part to be function of two, uh, 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 of radial and uh, polar angle separately because we wanted solution to be uh, uh, separable, okay? Then we look at the radial part, okay, now of this Laplacian because now it's a separable equation and that has to be solved by hypergeometric functions. Now to solve the radial part only by hypergeometric functions, Okay. It turns out that both of these functions, they have to be constant, okay? This, and so that very uniquely determines the war factor, the new war factor. So this delta, new war factor, is completely determined by insisting on separability and uh, the radial part will be solved by hypergeometric functions, okay? So that was our proposal for finding the box, okay? Yeah. You want to tell me what equations is that solving? Yeah. It's solving again equations of the original STU model, but I'll show you that in a second. But 
the box is supported by the matter fields of the STU model. The box is not the, 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 mm. the topology of the internal the space. I'll, I'll show you a bit what the topology is. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm spending, yeah, oh, oh gosh, I, oh, this is really slow. Yeah, let me, because I'm, I'm basically talking, <laughs> trying to talk. Anyway, let, let me speed up a bit. Look, the point is, this were, this were arguments, okay? Now, this is just playing a game with the space time, okay? And now I want to solve the wave equation by, by hypergeometric functions, and that was a regional black hole. And to solve it by hypergeometric functions, all I have to do is I have to uniquely change war factor to be of much simpler form. The, this stuff becomes just that, okay? So this is the war factor that solves the scalar uh, wave equation with hypergeometric functions, okay? Now, this box, is, and this is what I call boxes, this changes into that. This is what I call the box. Original black hole is, is now changing to the new geometry. The same classical properties of the horizons, totally unchanged, right? But asymptotics is changed, okay? Asymptotics is changed because the original one goes with r to the fourth. This one grows slower, okay? This is not asymptotically flat geometry. Okay. And it depends really only now on the four parameters that also specify the original thermal. Okay? So uh, let me remark now on the box, right? Namely, asymptotically, this is a geometry that is not flat anymore, but is of Lifshitz type, okay? With, with T uh, scaling with different power of R, okay? Specific Lifshitz. And also, it has a conical deficit, okay? So with Gary, we dub this asymptotics, asymptotically conical box, okay? That's how we determined it, okay? It is milder than ADS space. It, as, uh, repeating for the end time, keeps the horizon properties intact because it's independent of the war factor, okay? But, um, um, uh, but it's not asymptotically flat, however, it's softer than ADS. It's not ADS space, okay? The next thing is, is this new metric, is this box of original black hole, right, that I put black hole in, really solution of some equations of motion? Yes, it's still solution of this effective string theory Lagrangian, okay? It turns out to be associated now with all axiodilatons cons, uh, uh, equal, but running, okay? Now, three gauge potentials are, uh, uh, three gauge put are equal, and they basically correspond in this magnetic frame to, to, to constant magnetic field. Basically, what we've done is original black hole in this STM was immersed into constant magnetic field, governed by those three guys, and then A0 itself turns out to be basically, uh, in, in this frame, electric charge with magnetic electric charge, some product of pi C and pi S, okay? So original black holes was now put into this new box that is determined by putting the bo uh, this black hole into this constant magnetic field, okay? And I have not changed thermo. I have changed asymptotics. I, and I claim I have recovered also manifest conformal symmetry. Okay, so that's, so with all that, you know, um, we did not anticipate originally, but it turns out that the lift of this geometry on a circle to five dimensions becomes uh, locally ADS3 cross S2, okay? Somehow this box engineers the geometry in one dimension higher, which is the famous ADS3 cross S2, which is generically appears for all these near extremal or near BPS black holes, okay? So it's actually, it's, it's a rather trivial vibration of S2, trivial by con because of angular momentum over BTZ black hole, okay? Now one can use the, uh, the conformal symmetry of ADS3 space in this lifted geometry and promote it to Virazoro algebra, okay, which, which is dual to two-dimensional 
uh, uh, CFT, Ala Brown and Hanau, and then use the uh, standard uh, statistical entropy uh, a la Cardi to determine from this BTZ black hole the microscopic properties of the black hole entropy, which is guaranteed to be the same as a thermodynamic one. Okay, so this is one root somehow. You know, we we, we we've just removed this. As we put things in a, bla a black hole in a uh, in a box without changing areas of inner outer horizon or temperature, and then. God with this procedure manifest um, a conformal symmetry, which, which really reappears in some way by lifting it to ADS3, okay? So uh, due to the lack of time, really, you know, one can explore further the origin of this uh, geometry. So I r rather should say that just in one, sen one, one sentence, that actually this subtracted geometry that, that we obtain is related to original black hole through another uh, transformation on time reduced action, another type of uh, Harrison transformation, which is a boost that is uh, more asymmetric and basically in the limits changes the asymptotics of original black hole solution, which is subtracted geometry. And there was also an attempt to study uh, in the lifted geometry some of the aspects of dual CFT further in this context. Um, uh, uh, as a next classical thing I should mention, I presented this technique to determine subtractive geometry really uh, for the, um, this four charge prototype example, but it can be done actually for this most general four electric and four magnetic charge solution. Uh, again, it's related procedure to change the Bohr factor, get manifest conformal symmetry, but these things are horrendous, just as horrendous as the original black hole is, okay? And last but not least in this uh, classical approach, all that works all also in parallel for subtracted geometry of most general five-dimensional black holes, okay? In, uh, so that would be, again, maximal supersymmetric uh, effective action in five dimensions, and these black holes are, uh, in consistent truncation determined by three charges to angular momentum and mass. So all of these solutions uh, can be adjusted and obtained uh, uh, subtracted geometry uh, for them where the conformal symmetry appears to be more um, uh, manifest. Now, you see in part what people object in this approach is, I have to say because not many people continue working on that. This is not the original black hole. It has the same classical properties of global symmetry, namely horizons properties remain the same, but it's a new asymptotic solution, okay? And so do we really explain the full-fledged black hole or just adjusting the box in a way to get some manifest uh, conformal symmetry out of it, okay? So it's not the original black hole, so we have to be clear about that. Anyway, so this I spend most of my time explaining to few of you who have not heard about that, how we really motivated the appearance of uh, a subtracted geometry. And so I really don't have that much time, right, to turn to how we address the thermodynamics of this black hole, which was a key point. So I, I'm actually glad I summarized some of the things. So um, I don't have time to highlight some of the quantum aspects and really uh, turn uh, uh, to uh, really this algorithmic approach to determine now thermodynamics uh, of, um, in particular, of this example of uh, subtracted geometry and, and algorithmically address uh, uh, the, the steps to determine uh, the uh, covariant boundary action uh, with the whole now renormalized action uniquely defining for us conserved charges. So really in the last 10, 15 minutes, uh, I'll just highlight some of these aspects. I have seven minutes. What did I say, 15? No, no. 
in any way, uh, 10 minutes I actually meant, anyway. <laughs> So, so let me just, that was the summary when you still had paid some attention, right? And then I got diverted trying to explain basically to Gabriele what subtractive geometry was. In any way, uh, uh, so, so let's go algorithmically uh, uh, with steps that I summarized in the first part of my talk. So we are now looking at the subtractive geometry, okay? And we want to now identify in this parameterization of subtractive geometry, what would be our normalizable and what would be non-renormalizable modes? Okay, so uh, actually for technical reasons which will turn out to be useful, we first rescale radial and time coordinates, introducing two new parameters. And then, uh, as far as parameters, the subtractive geometry is parameterized by bear mass, bear angular momentum, this pi c and pi s coefficients. And we trade them in this parameterization in terms of this new rescale uh, coordinates. Uh, in this parameterization, we trade uh, now uh, these four parameters for three parameters, r plus minus and omega basically r plus minus r2 um, uh, basically two horizon param uh, par uh, parameterizations in the new coordinates and this is basically related to uh, to bare angular velocity okay these three parameters will be such that i can turn on and off those are what we call infrared parameters of the theory okay but then there is an asymptotic parameter that keeps my geometry uh, uh, conical Lefschetz geometry, which is key, which I'm going to parameterize as B parameter, is the, and this is what I would call the one that I cannot turn off arbitrarily. Okay. Now keep in mind that so we have R plus R minus omega as non normalizable modes that I can turn on and off, and B is non renormalizable mode, along with this crutch associated with two scaling parameters of time and radial coordinate. Okay. At the end, this B will be fixed up to radial diffeomorphisms or whatever additional global symmetries I have in this description. Okay. So, what I call this asymptotic solution, vacuum solution, will be solution when I turn off normalizable modes, and this is the same conical, asymptotically conical box that I mentioned earlier, okay? It's just now parameterized, you know, by this background parameter B, okay, non-renormalizable one, and the scaling parameters K and L, where, okay? Now, non-renormalizable mode will not be completely fixed, okay? Uh, it, uh, it will be fixed only up to radial diffeomorphisms and global symmetry of the theory, okay? So in particular, if I do radial rescaling of these parameters, okay, and the theory also has a global U1 symmetry, okay, by rescaling scalars along with the gauge potentials, okay? Uh, along with this two, two radial diffeomorphisms will turn out to keep these three parameters now uh, uh, in such a way that we keep this combination fixed, okay? So, so we have more freedom than in the original case, you know, by, by allowing this time and radial rescaling, okay? And then we keep that uh, uh, invariant only up to radial and global symmetries. In any case, we crank on the radial Hamiltonian formalism now in this approach because we want to go to, to large radial behavior of the theory of the, of the background solution. Uh, so introducing suitable radial coordinate uh, such that uh, along the constant slices, okay, this transverse uh, uh, direction becomes the real boundaries as radial coordinate goes to infinity. And then we do standard decomposition of the metric in terms of radial excitations and the transverse excitations, and also not only for the metric, but also for the gauge fields, okay? Uh, uh, now with uh, 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 this transverse excitation, okay, introduced for us uh, in the uh, radial Lagrangian, the natural canonical momenta, However, momenta conjugate, as well known, 
to those associated with radial excitations really vanish. So this is particular expansion in this uh, radial uh, Hamiltonian formalism. As a consequence, the Hamiltonian description now of the action along this radial direction is independent um, uh, really of the, um, uh, is independent of momenta conjugate to radial excitations. And so this radial excitations become actually uh, uh, Lagrange multipliers. Okay, and out of it we get in this Hamiltonian the natural uh, first class constraints uh, which are part of Hamilton Jacobi equations. And then uh, uh, furthermore, then we are after really now defining the, uh, the Hamilton function out of which we could, uh, uh, whose gradients really will determine for us again the corresponding canonical momenta. So this is rather a standard thing where we split this, uh, the set of second order equations into two sets of first order equations. Okay. But the key thing is in this uh, uh, is really to determine what is a covariant boundary action all right, that we are going to obtain by determining the action, the Hamiltonian action for this asymptotic solution. Okay. This solution diverges. So this action for asymptotic solution will, will diverge. Okay. And it, uh, so this divergent part of this asymptotic solution will uh, really uh, fix for us now the divergent action that we will identify with the covariant counterterm action. So with this Hamilton formalism, we go after this asymptotic vacuum solution, determine the action, in particular in the asymptotic that fixes for us then what we would call counterterm action. And is this counterterm action that we obtain from asymptotic solutions okay, that we add to original action? And it's this combination as we go to the boundary, right, to very large radial coordinate. Uh, becomes finite and independent of R, all right? And it's actually, this is highly non-trivial to determine this counterterm action for this background with this non-denormalizable mode. It was a bit surprising for us that actually it depended on additional arbitrary parameter alpha, this covariant action, though thermodynamics or charges at the end were unaffected by that, all right? So once we have determined this counterterm action, we have a regular action, well-defined, and that introduces then automatically for us renormalized canonical momenta, which now act as conserved currents in the theory. Okay, so to obtain the conserved currents, basically really this comes all out of this first class constraints, uh, conserved currents for gauge potentials, come from this first class constraint in the Hamiltonian, okay? Produces for us conserved charges that now in terms of our parameterization are completely fixed in terms both of the non-renormalizable modes and renormalizable modes as well as the scaling parameters and particular combination that we have to keep fixed. And then of course the standard conserved currents uh, coming from this uh, uh, first class constraint produce for us along the asymptotic killing vector directions, the conserved charges, which specify for us uniquely the mass and angular momentum. Okay, so this was, uh, the whole thing is to really identify the covariant count, uh, counterterm action, and that was uh, a non-trivial exercise. The rest goes automatically. Now with this parameterization, we get Euclidean action, associated with the free energy, again parameterized in terms of our uh, uh, renormalizable and non-renormalizable modes, and then uh, uh, it satisfy free energy, the, the standard Gibbs energy quantum statistical relation. In all this conserved char uh, currents, namely charges, uh, mass, as well as, of course, the horizon-related quantities satisfy 
the first law of thermodynamics and automatically the SMARTS formula. I should highlight that because actually in the work with Gary Gibbons, we also using Kumar integral, we address all these properties in our original parametrization in terms of M, A, Pi, C, and Pi, S. In this parametrization, it's actually we have six parameters subject to one constraint. So we have one more parameters associated with this class of diffeomorphisms. So it's a little bit more general. Okay, that's for Gary. Yeah, so in, in any way, so I, I have spent most of my time and the chair is already standing. Uh, <laughs> let me just conclude basically, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know whether I should feel bad or good that I spent too much time explaining to some of you what subtractive geometry is, but then as a consequence, uh, we applied this uh, uh, geometry uh, to studying its uh, systematically its thermodynamics by using basically um, uh, the variational principle uh, to determine consistently uh, in full generality finite conserved charges Okay, and then uh, prove that all the thermodynamics now works in this case properly. One thing I chose not to talk about, but it's sort of interesting that uplifting this subtractive geometry to five dimension produces for us ADS2 cross BTZ black hole, and we can now relate in very precise ways thermodynamics of this uh, subtractive geometry to actually thermodynamical variables. Uh, of BTZ geometry. And one upshot is it doesn't go directly because some parameters that were rather free, B was free, okay, up to this uh, diffeomorphism with the scaling parameters, okay. And this omega that was not quantized now is forced to be quantized and B has to be fixed. So that's sort of interesting to realize that actually the map from four to five is constrained and vice versa, okay. Uh, last but not least, okay, this uh, variation principle is not holographic in principle. It's really variational principle. So we are not assuming in principle that we have dual field theory holography, but the approach itself is very much suited to study holography, okay, to go beyond that step and, and trying to under, uh, address some of the features of dual field theory of whatever form it is there on the boundary, okay? And so that leaves us with lots of further work. Thank you. That's the first question one would ask oneself, right? In particular, specific heat is really, uh, could be negative for certain range of parameters, right? This box actually eliminates those guys. Those guys that sort of escape to infinity are not there. And we saw that in this box, the behavior of quasi-normal modes that we study with Gary, which I couldn't say, are all perfectly well behaved. There is no black hole bomb that the Kerr black hole could have, because this box eliminates precisely those pathological modes that you have due to asymptotic flatness. Okay, I'm not saying I'm answering that. I'm just saying bo this box, you know, eliminates bad modes while keeping the thermo of the horizon intact, okay? So pulls out the internal structure and takes out the bad asymptotics, okay? That's a, a good point, you know. So asymptotically flat black hole and black hole in a box, right? They are related through a certain type of Harrison transformations, okay? We can track, you know, in the orbits of all solutions of SDU model, right? 
I can introduce this Harrison, new Harrison transformation that starts interpolating between initial and origin and the subtracted geometry black hole. And uh, one could view that as a motion in the space, right, of solutions. Some connection maybe to some RG flow. That's actually what, what the Amsterdam group attempted to address. But actually, the way they view that is the formation in this space from subtracted germ to original via what they refer to specific irrelevant operators. Okay. So there is some RGE type flow ideas that could relate original black hole to the subtracted geometry one. 